Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our morning worship service here at Cornerstone. If you are visiting with us, either here in person or online, we extend a special welcome to you as well. I have the following announcements from Council. Council proposes to the congregation to extend a call to Dr. Ruben Bradenhoff from the Mount Nazura Free Reformed Church in Australia as Minister of the Word to be set apart for the training for the ministry at the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary. A short congregational meeting will be held following our morning worship service on Sunday, October the 9th, to review further details. The congregation is invited and encouraged to attend a congregational meeting to be held this Thursday evening, beginning at 7.30 in this church building, to kick off the Bible study season and to relaunch the service groups. Additional details can be found in the bulletin. A coffee social will be held after this morning's worship service in the basement, and you are all welcome to join. Today's host family, Herman and Jane Harsfort, are ready to welcome you into their home. If you would like to visit with them, you can meet them after this service at the main entrance to the auditorium by the members' mailboxes. The collections today in the pew are for the work of the deacons and at the door for the GEMS and Cadets program. And Pastor Darren will be leading us in worship, and we pray that our worship may be pleasing to God and a source of encouragement for all. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Please rise if you are able. Brothers and sisters, where does our help come from? Our help is in the name of the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. Receive God's greeting to you this morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's now sing together to our God uh, the words of Psalm 92, stanzas 1 and 2. As we prepare uh, once again to hear God's law, uh, let's read together, or let me read with you what we confess in Lord's Day 33 about how our life, the life of a Christian is to be one of repentance. Uh, Luther said that long ago, that our life is one of repentance, of constantly turning away from sin and constantly turning uh, more and more to God and more and more uh, praying for the Spirit to give us that, that delight for God's law. So let me read with you, Lord, say 33, what we confess there. What is the true repentance or conversion of man? It's the dying of the old nature and the coming to life of the new. 
Uh, what is the dying of the old nature? It's to grieve with heartfelt sorrow that we have offended God by our sin, and more and more to hate it and flee from it. What is the coming to life of the new nature? It is a heartfelt joy in God through Christ and a love and delight to live according to the will of God in all good works. So as we listen to God's will expressed in the Ten Commandments, let's pray that the Holy Spirit might also give us that delight for God's law that we see that God's law is for our good. It's like beautiful guardrails. If you think about some um, pathways or some roads that go on mountains, you're very thankful for those guardrails. And God's law is like a guardrail saying, don't go down those roads. It will only end in misery. So let's listen to God's good law. Exodus 20. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You are your son or your daughter, your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Let's sing together uh, in response to God's law, words of Psalm 38, 1 and 8. Come then humbly before our God in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you again, and we come before you uh, knowing who you are, in awe of you, in awe of your power and your glory as we think about how that's displayed in creation, as we think about the stars and many galaxies in this universe and think that by your mighty word you flung them into existence 
When we think of how powerful you are and how glorious you are and how majestic you are, we can feel very small. And when we hear your law again, we hear the, the thundering of your law as your voice spoke at Mount Sinai. We know how the people reacted, that they trembled and they were afraid. And they asked Moses to go up the mountain. They asked Moses to mediate lest they die. And Father, we pray that you might work that humility in our own hearts. That we come before you not in our own strength, not in our own righteousness, not because we are so wonderful or so obedient, but that we come before you only through Jesus Christ, our great mediator. And that in him we can then approach your throne with confidence because of what he's done for us. Because your wrath descended on him so that it might never more descend on us. Because all of our sins were carried by our dear Savior as he walked to the cross, as he hung there on the cross, rejected by earth, rejected by heaven. He who knew no sin was made to be sin, so that in him today we might become the righteousness of God. And so we come before you, dear Father, pleading the case of Jesus Christ. We pray that as you see us, that you look to Jesus Christ, that you see us in him, that you see us as righteous and as holy as he is because we are covered with his righteousness. And so we pray that you might work in our hearts powerfully by the Holy Spirit, that we might know what our Savior has done for us, that we might not be stuck in guilt or regret and shame, but that we might bring that to the cross, that we might know the freedom of being your sons and daughters. We pray then that we might delight in your will. We might delight in your law not to earn your favor or your grace, but because of your favor and grace that was poured out upon us, grace upon grace upon grace. And we pray then that you work deep down into our heart that we see your law as good, that we delight in it. We want to hear it, that we want to also do your will, that we want to serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we pray this morning that you open our hearts then to the word of Christ. And we might listen to his word, that we might want to be listeners of the word, but also doers of the word. As we come to rest in Christ, we want to also follow him. Because as the disciples said long ago, where else would we go? You have the words of life. And so open our hearts and our minds then to your word of life. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please open God's word then to what we find in uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians. We'll be looking at the next uh, five verses or so. Of Philippians chapter 3. Paul here, as a reminder in Philippians 3, he's changing the focus. He's uh, urging the Philippians to stand firm, to watch out for uh, those who are uh, finding their security in themselves for uh, salvation instead of in uh, Christ and his righteousness. And Paul gives the example of his own life and how he's pressing on to the goal. And then as we'll look at this morning, he uh, encourages us to follow his example and others who are following uh, the example of Christ. So Philippians 3, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. Uh, If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, 
as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let's uh, sing together in response to uh, the reading of God's word, the hymn before the throne of God above, that as we read the word of Christ, we might now have our, our minds and our hearts lifted up to Christ, who right now is at the right hand of God. So, uh, before the throne of God above. Christ to us, Philippians 3, verse 17. Philippians 3, verse 17, page 981 of the Pew Bible. Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, 
and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Please keep your Bibles open as we will be referring to the text throughout. Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, whose example are you following today? Think about this for a minute. Whose example are you following? No, we all follow examples. You see this already from a very young age. You see young children following the example of their parents or following the example of elder or older siblings. We have one son who likes to uh, imitate his older brother going to school. He puts on his backpack, constantly going out the front door. He wants to be like his big brother. And that's not just when we're young. We are imitators. Maybe you can think of a, a time in your life where you spent a lot of time with someone and you noticed that you began to talk like them a bit. Maybe they talked very quickly and you started noticing that you talked a bit quicker. Uh, maybe you noticed that you were taking on their mannerisms and their expressions. I'm sure you can think of times where you were imitating someone. We are imitators. And Paul, he, uh, he talks about this then in the passage before us this morning. Paul, he, he sets before uh, the Philippians two different patterns of living. Two different ways of walking. He talks, first of all, about himself, Timothy, and others who are walking the way of of the cross, walking the way of uh, suffering to glory. The ones who are pressing on, pressing on to to know Christ more, pressing on to know him in the, the power of his resurrection, also to fellowship with him in suffering. Those who are pressing on to the day when they know Christ fully. And then he talks about those who are walking a very different way. Those who are walking as enemies of the cross. Those whose eyes are fixed entirely on this world instead of the world to come. Those who are living by the values and the priorities of this world. Those who are not living for the future with Christ, but living for the present, living for the here and now, living for instant gratification. And so the question then comes again, who are we imitating today? Who are we imitating? Paul, he urges us, verse 17 as you see there, he urges us to keep our eyes on, to closely examine, as it can be translated, those who are walking the way Paul is as he follows his Savior. We are to be kind of like detectives, closely examining the footprints of those who have followed their Savior, those who have denied themselves, those who are walking the way of suffering to glory. And so let's keep our eyes on their example. Let's think about this question this morning. Whose example are you imitating? That's the theme. Whose example are you imitating? We'll look first at those whose minds are on earthly things, verses 18 and 19. So Paul, in urging the Philippians to, to keep their eyes on those who are walking uh, the way of the cross, those who are uh, pressing on to know Christ more, He talks about those who are walking a very different path. He says in verse 18, For many, of whom I've often told you and now tell you with tears, many walk 
as enemies of the cross of Christ. You might wonder, who is Paul talking about? He's talking about unbelievers here. He could be talking about unbelievers, but more likely, he's talking about those who profess to be Christian, but show themselves to be unchristian. Who show themselves, when it comes down to it, their daily lives are living as enemies of the cross are refusing to walk the path of the cross of suffering to glory. Those who want glory now. Those who are fixed on the now. Those who refuse to live a life in the shadow of the cross. And so Paul, he talks more about them. Verse 19, in the middle, he says, Their God is their belly. So those who are walking as enemies of the cross, their God is their belly. And what is Paul saying here? Is he saying that they're worshiping their tummy? No, what he's saying is an expression here. He's saying the people who are walking as enemies of the cross have made an idol out of satisfying fleshly desires. They're enslaved to bodily desires. Their God, their idol, the thing that they're worshiping is the here and now. It's satisfying their desires and passions. The attitude, kind of like where we read elsewhere in Scripture, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Live for today. You hear it today, maybe something similar. You only live once. You know that expression, YOLO, you only live once? So live each day as if this is all there is. Gratify your desires. Fulfill your passions. Do what you want, because this is all there is. Their God is their belly. And he goes on, he says, they glory in their shame. They're boasting about things that they should actually be shameful about. They're boasting in their shame. And don't you hear that today? People boasting in things they should be shameful of. Boasting in how many people they've slept with. Boasting in how much they can drink. Boasting in their own accomplishments. Boasting of times in their life where they put others down and where they were exalted. Boasting in things that should really be seen as shame in God's sight. And Paul then gives a summary of how they are walking. He says, they're walking with minds, at the end of verse 19, with minds set on earthly things. Their minds are set on earthly things. Paul often uses this uh, word group here in Philippians, the minds. Remember in Philippians 2, he talked about how we as Christians are to have the minds of Christ. We're to have the same mindset as Christ. The mindset we see when he walked the path of humiliation. And Paul, in just a few verses before our text, in 3 verse 15, he's talked about those who are mature... Uh, should think the same way. He's using the same word there, think, or should have the same mindset. So there's a huge contrast here between those who have mindset on earthly things and what the mindset that Paul exhorts us to. The mindset of pressing on, the mindset of looking to Jesus Christ, the mindset of wanting more and more to have that day where he returns and we are totally conformed to him. The mindset of those who are enemies of the cross is set on earthly things, is fixed on earthly things. And yet the tragedy of it all is where their path leads. Where their path leads. Look what Paul says at the beginning of verse 19. Their end is destruction. Their end is misery and ruin. They're walking the path of what they think is glory now. Satisfying their desires. Getting what they want. But Paul says in the end, the path that they're walking is a path that leads to ruin. A path that leads to destruction. They're fixing their eyes. They're setting their hope. They're setting everything on this earth on things that are passing away. You know, there's an example I once heard that stuck with me. Remember... Maybe some of you can recall, maybe you don't want to think about winter, but you see these big snow piles everywhere. And especially at the mall, you get these huge piles of snow. And they look pretty mighty. They get pretty solid. 
as the bottom parts get more and more strong throughout the winter. Now imagine you decide to set your hope on that pile of snow. Imagine you, you build a little castle and you put all of your treasures, all of your dreams, all of your goals, all of your aspirations, everything into that little castle on that pile of snow. And then the power of the spring sun comes along. That mighty pile of snow melts away. And all that's left, as you look at these big piles, all that's left is dirt, garbage, nothing. And you know how many people are living like they're building castles on snow piles. Living like this world is all there is, putting all of their hopes, all of their dreams, all of their treasures, everything, investing entirely in this world. Are we imitating those who live this way? Those who are boasting in things that cause, should cause them shame. Those who are boasting and satisfying themselves and making a God of their desires and living as if this world is all there is. On those whose end is destruction, on those whose eyes are not on Christ, who are not living for the sure future in Christ, but are living for the here and now only. You know, Jesus talked about this path. He used the same word Paul uses, the word destruction. He says in Matthew chapter 7, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. Are we imitating those who are walking that broad path? Especially teens, listen carefully. Are you going with the flow? Are you going with the masses following the hundreds and thousands who are walking this path that leads to destruction, who are walking the path of setting their minds entirely on this earth? Who have no view for the future in Christ? who reject the cross as foolishness or who reject that the way to glory is through suffering? Are you following those who are boasting in things that are shameful? Who are you following? Are you following social media influencers or celebrities or or friends, whoever it might be? that are glorying in things that should bring shame. That are seeking the path of glory now, the path of influence, the path of honor. Instead of realizing that the path of a Christian is one of humility. Do you all hear the call of Christ again as he comes to us, as he comes and preaches peace to us? as he comes and urges us to follow him, to tread the road less traveled. Do you hear him call to you this morning and say, come, my dear ones, die to yourself. Die to your selfish ways. Die to the old way of life governed and enslaved to self, to your passions and lusts and idols. Die to that attitude and mindset of living for this world. But come to me. Come take up your cross and follow me. Take your sin, your selfishness, your old self to the cross. And as your old self is crucified with me, as the body ruled by sin is done away with, know that you're no longer slaves to sin. Romans 6, verse 5 and 6. Do you hear him calling you to trust in him? To know that his path is the path of life. As the disciples said long ago, when Jesus asked, are you too going to abandon me? And one of them said, where else would we go, Lord? Where else would we go? Because you have the words of life. 
Do you hear Christ calling you and saying to you, know that as you die to self, you truly live. Know that as you die to yourself, you truly live, that you're no longer slaves shackled to selfishness, but freed sons and daughters. Are you this morning enslaved to sin? Is sin ruling your heart? Do you feel like you are one who is shackled to that road leading to destruction? Well, come to Jesus Christ and hear him as he says, Come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, he says. And know that if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Freed from the guilt of sin. Freed from the power of sin. Even as we still struggle with its presence. So brothers and sisters, you hear Christ's call. Have you brought that old self and crucified it, knowing that it's crucified with Christ on the cross? You counted yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus means, yes, we will still struggle mightily against sin, but sin will not be our master because Jesus Christ is. Do you know that, that wonderful realization that you are no longer shackled to the path leading to destruction, but that you are tied with bonds of love to Jesus Christ, united to him? You know, brothers and sisters, as we think about many who are walking that path, to destruction. As we think about them, what should our attitude be? We skipped over this. But you know what Paul says? He says in 3, uh, verse 18, that beginning, he says, for many, and then he breaks off, and he says, for many as often, uh, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies. And you know, this is very powerful. In the Greek, you see uh, how vivid this is. So Paul, he would have uh, dictated his letters to a scribe. And you see here that Paul, he starts a thought. He says, uh, for many are walking, literally. And then as he, he talks about this, as he's dictating this letter, suddenly you can, you can, as you read it, you can see his emotions are welling up. And as he's starting to think of those who are walking as enemies of the cross, he says, and now even I tell you, even with tears. As he dictates this letter, his emotions well up. He breaks off, his eyes well up. And the word actually, it says, uh, with tears. The word means weeping, with emphasis on the noise that accompanies that weeping. So here's Paul, he's dictating this letter. He's warning the Philippians about those who are walking a different path. And as he's thinking about these who are walking a different path, he starts sobbing. As I tell you now, he says, even with tears. He's sobbing. He's crying as he thinks about those who are, whose end is destruction. It's the same word used of Jesus as he comes to Jerusalem. The triumphal entry in Luke 19, verse 41. And as he sees Jerusalem in its beauty, Jesus is weeping. And he says, if only you had known the day of your visitation. If only you had known the things that make for peace. And Paul here, sharing in the heart of his Savior, is sobbing over those who don't know the things that make for peace. For those who are walking a path that ends to destruction. And so where is your attitude? Where is your heart at? Do you share in the heart of Christ as you also see that in Paul? What do you think about those who are living entirely ungodly lives? What do you think about them? You say, well, I thank God that I'm not like them. Do we have that self-righteous and smug attitude? How can we? When it's only by grace, grace upon grace, that that God has pulled you off that road leading to destruction, that Christ has grabbed hold of you. And put you on a new road. 
And so what's our attitude to those who are living as enemies of the cross? Those who are living entirely for this world? Those who might even profess to be Christians but show that they are not at all connected to Christ? Don't the tears at times well up? I know elders, you've experienced this when running after those who are straying. Frustrated tears as they run away, as you're running after them. What is our attitude? Let's move on then to the second point. Those whose minds are on heavenly things. Verses 20 and 21. Paul, instead of, so for us, instead of examining and following those who are a walk in this path of destruction. We're urged to follow the example of Paul and others who's, who see their citizenship as in heaven, who, who are eagerly awaiting a savior from there. Paul says, verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. This would have been a very a familiar term for the Philippians. Remember, we talked about this before. The Philippians, uh, Philippi, the city, was a colony of Rome. Uh, They were gifted with Roman citizenship, which was a high honor. And so they had access to Rome. Uh, They had the privileges of Rome. But they were also called then to uh, spread Roman culture. They had Roman laws, we read about. They uh, wore Roman dress. They were kind of like a colony, living far from Rome, and yet uh, exuding the life and the values of Rome to the culture around them. And so Paul is using this concept that the Philippians would have been uh, very familiar with to help them understand their calling as Christians. He's calling them to be a colony of heaven. That even though the homeland is far away, they are called to be a colony of heaven. They are called to exude the values of heaven, the life of heaven, in a world of death and darkness. And this helps us then to understand what our calling is as cornerstone. Sometimes I think for you, for me, it's, it, it can be difficult knowing what our role is in this world. Sometimes we might think that we need to just insulate from the world, kind of just tiptoe through, and hopefully no one really notices us. And we're called, in line with the Philippians, we're called to be kind of like an outpost of heaven, a colony of heaven, that here we are called to be a colony of heaven, that we have access to heaven, we have the privileges of heaven, we're citizens of heaven, but we're living out the life and the the beauty of heaven here on earth. Living out the laws and the life and the culture of heaven. We're to be the aroma of Christ in a world that smells like decay and death. We're to show by our speech and by our actions, and by how we live, that we are from a different country, that our citizen belongs, citizenship belongs in heaven. Show by our speech and actions that we belong to a different place. You know, we have this often, when you hear someone, a distinctive accent, you can know where they're from. You say, oh, you're from this and this place. I can tell by how you talk, or by your expressions, or uh, by your accent. And so it is to be in this world that people, by, our, by our, how we talk, shows that we're citizens of heaven, shows that we're followers of Christ. Is this something, brothers and sisters, that you think about, that by faith you are citizens of heaven, that by faith you have access to heaven, you have all the privileges of heaven, that by being united to Christ, all that is his is already yours. Are you living like you're citizens of heaven, that already you have Christ as your brother, you have God as your father, that already you are princes and princesses who have a stake and a claim on that new heaven and new earth? That already you hear the end time judgment pronouncements of God on you. Where he says there's no condemnation for you in Christ. That already we have saints in heaven who are our companions as we'll sing after. Lo, what a cloud of witnesses encompass us around. 
That already today, as we come together and sing, we come to Mount Zion, as we read in Hebrews 12, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. That as we come here, we come and we are connected to the worship of heaven. We're participating today in the worship of heaven. Think about that the rest of the service as you're singing, that you're joining the songs of thousands of angels above who are also singing in praise of the Savior. You know that as citizens of heaven, your names are written in permanent ink in the ledger of heaven. That not even Satan exerting all his power and all of his demonic forces can possibly erase your name from the book of life there in heaven. But there's a chair at the marriage feast of the Lamb that has your name on it. Citizens of heaven. And so live then as a colony of heaven here. Exude the life of heaven. The aroma of Christ in a world of darkness. And as you live as a colony of heaven, look not inward or downward, but look outward and upward. As Paul says, verse 20, second part, from it, from heaven, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, Paul is once again using words the Philippians would have understood. The Philippians, they looked to Rome for help. They looked to the emperor who is often called Lord and Savior. They looked to Rome for help in their distress if there was war or if their lives were in danger. They looked to that emperor to come with his armies and rescue them. And Paul is here urging then the, the Philippians and us to not look for earthly kingdoms to rescue us, but to look to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To eagerly await the time when he comes and transforms our our lowly bodies, our bodies of humility, to be like his glorious body. To eagerly await the one who will rescue us. As brothers and sisters, we are the suffering bride of Christ. I know many of you are suffering. I know many of you cry out, how long? Many of you are tired, sick, Lonely, chronically in pain, stressed out, grieving deeply. But dear church, look up. Look up to the only one who can rescue you from the deepest miseries of this world. The only one who can answer the deepest longings of your heart as you cry out, how long? The one who promises that he is going to come back and he is going to rescue us and he is going to bring us home. Are you eagerly awaiting his return when he comes on the clouds of heaven, when he comes and he brings heaven down, when he weds heaven and earth forever? The time when the new earth is going to be full of the glory of God. The whole new earth will be the holy of holies exuding the glory of God because of Jesus who unites things in heaven and things on earth in himself. Are you eagerly awaiting your homeland? Eagerly looking forward to, as we read it, the saints did in Hebrews 11, looking forward to the city whose designer and builder is God looking forward to the heavenly country. Are you longing for home? Well, maybe some of you have experienced that, this longing for home. I know one time I had that. It was only gone for three weeks on a mission internship. At the end, my wife and I, we longed for Canada. We longed to see a Tim Hortons. We longed to see the Canadian flag. Do you have that longing for your true homeland? Longing for that day when Christ will transform your bodies to be like his. Longing for your destination. You know, one pastor once said, when we book a trip, how many of us concentrate on 
you know, when we're thinking about this trip? How many of us concentrate on the destination? And how many of us concentrate on the plane ride there? Well, I think all of us think about the destination where we're going. As we plan a trip, we're excited to go there. We're thinking about it. We're not thinking about the airplane trip there. And so for us, let's think about our destination more. Let's think about where we are heading. Let's think about the new heavens and the new earth. Let's think about Christ who will be at the center there. Let's think about the glories of this new heaven and earth. And I want to share with you before we close a poem I read from John Piper about the new heavens and new earth. He writes a poem and he says, As I knelt beside the brook of eternal life to drink, I knew that I was on the brink of endless joy. And everywhere I turned and saw a wonder there. The blind can see a bird on wing. The dumb can lift their voice to sing. The diabetic eats at will. The coronary runs uphill. The lame can walk. The deaf can hear. The cancer-ridden bone is clear. Arthritic joints are lithe and free. And every pain has ceased to be. And every sorrow deep within and every trace of lingering sin is gone. And all that's left is joy and endless ages to employ the mind and heart and understand and love the sovereign Lord who planned that it should take eternity to lavish all his grace on me. Think about the destination. Our sufferings here are soon endured. And so brothers and sisters, examine the footprints of those who are walking this path of suffering to glory. Live, look at those who are living as citizens of the kingdom, who exude the life of heaven and the aroma of the gospel. Follow the example of those who live in the shadow of the cross while at the same time in the bright light of the resurrection. Look to those who with eager expectation are awaiting their Savior to return and transform their bodies to be like his glorious body. Amen.
In our prayer this morning, we'll remember our sister Anna Piper, whose uh, brother-in-law, George uh, Strope, passed away uh, early last night. And so we'll pray for uh, his wife, Diane, children, and grandchildren. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. And we think of the beauty of the moment that even now, prayers rise like incense to your throne room. That even now we join the choirs of angels as we worship here on earth. We join the choir in heaven. That even now we can communicate to you, our Father, to our home country. And we thank you for that. We thank you that we can know you hear us. That you have sent your spirit down to us as a counter pledge that one day heaven will come to earth. One day the whole earth will be your holy of holies. And we thank you for this and we pray that you encourage us. Encourage those among us who are falling, those who are tired, those who are weary. Give them the strength of Christ to carry on in his strength, to press on, to want to know Christ in his suffering and in his resurrection power. Please work on us too that we don't focus and examine the lives of those whose end is destruction those who are heading the path to ruin, those who are fixing their eyes entirely on this world. We pray that we might look to godly individuals like Paul, who in turn follow Jesus Christ, who follow the path of the cross, live in the shadow of the cross while at the same time in the bright light of the resurrection. We pray that you be with our elders as they be frustrated at times, running after those whose minds are set on earthly things. Please give them courage in their tiredness and frustration. Give them strength. Be with our deacons as well as they show the love of Christ to members as they encourage us to be a body that cares for one another, that encourages one another, that shares our resources, and our gifts with one another. Please be with our pastors as well. Pastor John, myself, Brom. Be with Brom and Celia, especially as they head back home later this week. We thank you for their presence among them. We pray that you give them safe travels. We pray that they might have the, the courage and the strength in Christ, the power in Christ to continue their task in Maceo. We pray that you be with those among us who are grieving. We ask that you be with Anna Piper, be with her sister, Diane. She mourns the loss of her husband. Be with her children, grandchildren. Give them the tears even of sorrow, but the tears of hope that we can rest in the resurrection of Christ as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. We pray that you be with those who are recovering from surgery. We ask that you be with Tracy Stam. She recovers as she awaits uh, biopsy results. Give her the peace of Christ to fill her heart and mind as she waits. Be with those who continue to undergo treatments. Be with Anita DeYoung. Lisa Smouter, hold these sisters in your loving hand. We pray that you be with others among us who are dealing with chronic pain or dealing with illnesses that are undiagnosed, those who are frustrated or lonely or tired, those who feel like they can't carry on. Give them the strength and the power of Christ that they might know that in their weakness your strength is displayed. Please be with the work among our churches too. We think in particular this morning of Streetlight Ministries. Continue to bless the work there to reach 
those who are walking in darkness. We pray that you might bless their efforts, bless their work. We pray that all of us too, that we might have hearts of compassion for those who are lost, those who are unbelievers or those who are professing to be Christian but living a very unchristian life. We pray that you might change their hearts. You, we pray that you, Holy Spirit, might go into, deep into their hearts, doing what we cannot do, and that we might then rest in your comfort. We pray that you uh, be with us all as church here, that we might see ourselves as a colony of heaven, that we might in ordinary ways exude the life of heaven, that we don't have to be special or We don't have to be amazing, but that in our ordinary lives, in our weak lives, our lives marked by the cross, that we can show the life of Jesus Christ. And so we pray that as church, we might continue marching on, following our commander, looking to our Savior, standing firm in the Lord. And so we pray all this only in his name alone. Amen. Our offering this morning is for the work, the deacons, and after we'll sing hymn 73, 1, 2, 3, and 4.
Dear brothers and sisters, receive God's blessing and go your way with his peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.